Hey guys, uh, Matt Laker here. I'm with Ali, who's uh, an entrepreneur working in real estate industry. And I think Ali's going to be the best person here to introduce yourself a little bit uh, briefly. Hey Ali, thanks for being here on my channel. Um, do you mind sharing a little bit of your story, how you started and how are you here from, you know, where you started? Sure. Um, so my name's Allie and I used to be an engineer. Uh, well, let me, even before that, I grew up hearing the go to school, get the good grades, go get the steady, secure job, high paying job. So I did. And I started out in aerospace engineering. And I worked in that industry for about five years. And the minute I walked into that job, I just looked around at my cubicle office. It was horrible. And I thought, oh, God, I was like, I've, I have to get out. And so I spent about five years just trying to figure out my way out of corporate. I didn't really have a service or a product or whatever to offer people necessarily. Um, I also flew planes. That wasn't really much I could offer people. And so I had tons of skills, but nothing... I could do much with. So I explored and I was exploring both kind of business and real estate because I knew one of those two things would get me out. Ironically, I ended up starting a real estate business. So um, that was more just kind of, it was unintended. But so I, I left corporate, I started my company and I'm, well, I'm sure we'll get into more details of that. But uh, it's now been five and a half years, almost six years that I've been a full blown entrepreneur. I've been through the entire roller coaster of sanity, finances, uh, business building, business hardship, anything you can imagine. And, but my kind of claim to fame is that I work when I want to, I sleep in when I want to, like even with the stresses of entrepreneurship, I've structured my company in such a way that I don't have set hours. I can travel and just take my laptop. Everything's online. So I'm location independent. Uh, it's almost 1.30 in the morning my time and I'm up working because I actually like working late. Um, yeah, so that's, I've been, my big shtick is like, I'm huge on having fun. Like life is too short to just be stuck doing whatever you hate doing. And, you know, I've had stresses with building a business, but at the end of the day, it's completely worth it because I'm doing what I want when I want. And yeah, so I'm a lifestyle designer for sure. And I love helping other people do that because if I could get more people having as much fun as I am, then I think mm -hmm. I've succeeded. So do you, are you, are you getting fun through working? Are you just, you know, giving yourself tasks and are you going into your business uh, with what is fun for you? Or are you rather like sacrificing yourself a little bit for the fun in the future? Or is it both at the same time? It's, I'm not sacrificing myself by any means because I feel like when I'm the kind of personality, when I'm in charge and I'm, and I'm calling the shots, I'm having fun. Uh, I would be lying if I said that my, of the, and I love real estate. I love everything I do. I love my company, but if I didn't have to do it, I probably wouldn't either. Um, but I love it because I can be me in it but I'm also huge on outsourcing. I have employees. So if I disappear for a week and go on vacation, no big deal. I've got my employees who, and this is a whole different topic in itself, but I've found people who are better at certain things in my company than I am. And so really that's, that's one of my favorite things about business is putting those puzzle pieces together and finding the people who a can take the load off of me so I can kind of enjoy what I am doing, but they can also strengthen those aspects that I couldn't either. So, I do that, but that's essentially to, it's, it's like a vehicle. So it's the vehicle for me to do what I want with the rest of my time. I enjoy working when I work, but it is a vehicle to be able to do stuff. I still teach flying. I still, you know, I go snowboarding and I do all these things. So it's a little bit of both for sure. Can you, can you share more on outsourcing? Cause this is a very interesting topic for the guys watching my channel. We talk a lot about outsourcing, about VAs, about hiring people yeah. through either Upwork or other platforms, about process creation and uh, all this kind of stuff. Can you share how you're actually creating processes in your business as an advice to other guys trying to, you know, get their brick and mortar business to work a little bit more online with good working yeah. processes so they can go to, Denver for 
snowboarding yeah. if they want to. Exactly. See, and, and that's the whole thing is, you know, like if some people don't understand when you start a business, if you start a business that you're a hundred percent a required part in, have you really freed yourself up? So it's kind of the difference of working in your business versus having your business. And yeah, so outsourcing is one of my favorite things because it kind of appeases my engineering brain of like, like I said, putting all the pieces of the puzzle, puzzle together. Um, and I think I actually haven't had to get huge on processes with mine because I'm a smaller, more boutique company. And every person who works for me and with me, we all have our, things that we do like it's very and, and actually one of my girls she is probably my left arm in my company she runs our entire database our entire whatever and i haven't really i logged into the old versions of it but since we got so big i don't even know how to work it like i know that's horrible because if she were to up and disappear i don't i don't know how to do her stuff but i've really kind of gotten these people who and i've kind of nurtured them along the way to almost create their own processes because again they're smarter in it than i am like i can't run a database like she can and so i've really kind of given them the freedom to create that kind of stuff but even long before the processes come in is so many entrepreneurs like most people starting a business we're very capable people we're very smart oftentimes maybe we're control freaks to a certain degree like that's what's gotten us to be to the point that we can do this in the first place. And, but the, the kind of counter to that is we oftentimes have a hard time letting go or letting other people do things. And I'm telling you, it is really, you know, to hold. So I think everyone should start doing everything because you have to kind of do it organically where you start figuring out, okay, now I don't have time to do that. Or now I'm actually costing myself more money, spending the time to try and figure this out than let someone else do it. And my, but my favorite example of it is I was doing my own website for a long time, which is a joke because I'm horrible at that kind of stuff. But I had this one problem. It was a Friday afternoon at like 1 PM or 2 PM or something. And I had this little problem that I could not figure out. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to figure it out. Like it's going to happen. And I'm not kidding. It was either seven or nine hours later or something. I had driven myself crazy. And I find I had not figured it out and I had just met my, what turned out to be my web guy. And I said, Hey, random question. Do you know how to do this? He fixed it in like less than three minutes. I mean, and he was a VA and I, I probably paid him under $5 to do what I had just spent nine hours trying to figure out myself. And that was the moment that I realized now I understand what people are talking about exchanging it, like the, your time value of money money value of time time the value of your time basically mm -hmm. and so that really started this idea of getting rid of the things that either I don't like doing or I'm not that good at and when you get people on your team who are really good at those things and they love it then I can stick to the things that I love they can do the things they love we're all working to the best of our abilities and I think it just brings the whole capability of everything up versus me sitting here and trying to trying to do something I'm not good at. So I think a lot of it's a self-awareness of like, what are my strengths? What am I not so good at? What would someone be better at? What can I pay them? And really taking the effort to put those pieces together. And in the cases that you need established processes or systems, take the time to do it once and you're free for the rest of the time. So I, I just, I could go on for hours about how much I believe in outsourcing and how I think it's critical for a company to succeed. This is awesome. This is such a cool story. Can you can you uh, spice this up a little bit with uh, some hands-on advice for the guys how they can do this? So, uh, where are you finding VAs? Uh, which software do you use to manage them? If you use any, maybe not. Maybe you know I'm mm -hmm. making this too complicated. But could you give some advice for the guys? Like, hey, I I'm working all the time, like 16 hours a day, and I want to get yeah. some of these. $5 yeah. an hour, awesome developers. Yeah. So I, all of mine come from Upwork, which used to be called something. I uh, think Elance. They used to call it Elance or something like yeah, that. I, what, uh, I think that was a different one. I don't remember. I guess it doesn't matter what the old name is, but um, it's Upwork. 
And I somehow found, I found them to be the most user friendly. I haven't explored new sites in a couple of years, but I found them to be very user friendly. And I've kind of debated about it because in the beginning there were no fees attached. Like I just paid my folks, whatever I paid them. And now Upwork actually charges me a fee. It's like a percentage on how much I pay each week. And I started thinking, I was like, you know, my folks have been with me for so long. Should I hire them outside of Upwork? and skip these fees. And the more I thought about it, what I like about Upwork is a couple of things is for one, I don't have to, I don't have to send anyone a 1099, for example, like me and detailed logistics. I don't really want to do it if I don't have to, I don't know how 1099, I don't even know how to generate them. So Upwork takes care of that. There's still an accountability factor because there's the live work diary. So if I want to check up on somebody, I have it. I like the idea, especially when I hire new people to have some kind of recourse. Like if this person just absolutely screws me, I can report them to Upwork. You know, it's, it's the leveraging type of thing. So I've kind of concluded that I just keep everybody there. Oh, I've a couple people I've pulled off of it and we've done separate things, but for the most part, I really like them. And the one thing that I will say, you know, there's a difference. Like if I just need a web guy, I don't need him to speak proper English. Whereas if somebody is going to do my social media and post on my behalf, I need them speaking perfect English. I need them speaking my, you know, there's different variances of what I need in somebody, but I will tell you my, if I were to give an Upwork trick and I'm sure it, it could apply to any of them is let's say I need a job done and I need to hire somebody. What I had to learn the hard way is that if I, you can search for people on there and it's kind of fun. It's like shopping and you're shopping for people like, Ooh, this person sounds cool. And Ooh, this it's, it's fun. But what I found out very quickly is that if I ask people, Hey, can you do this job? They will say yes, because they want to get hired. And I figured out that they can say yes, but that doesn't mean necessarily that they can do it or they can do it well. So what I've now figured out is anytime I need a job posting, I, or anytime I need a job done, I put the posting up and I let people come to me. And it seems like a very small difference of me reaching out to people versus them reaching out to me, but it has been game changing. And that is the only way that I have found the good people who have stuck with me. And because then you'll get a ton of applications and most of them are not going to be that great, but you can start filtering them out and there's going to be one or two golden nuggets possibly in there. And you're like, Hey, and then I start talking to them. I message with them. And it, it sounds kind of dumb again is like, how well are we communicating? Because how well we're communicating now is going to be a tell for how well we communicate later. Um, so yeah, that's my absolute number one trick is post it and let people come to you and prove to you because everybody will, I, no one's going to say no, they all want the work. So that really kind of got me in a pickle for a while. And I had some not so great VAs, but most of the ones with me now have been with me for four or five years. And then I've had some great ones on and off for project based stuff. And yeah, so I don't know if that helps much. Yeah, this is awesome. That's very, very hands on. And um, you let these guys build processes in the business or how does this work? Or do you have someone else doing this? How do you create this uh, sort of automated procedures? Do you record um, let's say videos using Camtasia, like screen share and put this in Dropbox and just explain them how to do it this way? Or do you draw processes using draw IO or any other tool like that? Or do you, do you, do you capture these procedure, procedures somehow? Or what's your, what's your take on that? Well, I'll be kind of a letdown. I am so technologically not good. Um, I've never even had my own Facebook page. Um, so I'm a little more ancient. Like I have all my folks always want to use Google docs and I, I will use it, but I don't, I'm so old school. Like I need an actual word document or actual Excel. Like I, I'm not very good on the programs, anything side. So I can't offer much on that. But as far as like the process is getting developed, it's a little bit of a collaboration. Sometimes some things, uh, like our database, uh, our database girl has created the whole thing because I just, it's out of my hand. I mean, it's not out of my hands. Everything's in my hands, but it's, she has such a handle on it that I haven't had to worry much about it. Whereas like my marketing girl, her and I usually, we kind of, we have an informal system where we kind of 
go back and forth with the ideas. Uh, she always creates the first draft of anything because I, I can't get drafts out necessarily, but as soon as she gives me something and I'm like, Oh, then I can start seeing a bigger picture and then I can offer the edits. Um, but it's really, you know, and like we even have like automated email sequencing and we've had funnels and we've had all this stuff, but I just, <laughs> I'm so bad at that stuff myself. Like I can review it. I can look, I can see, I'm like, okay, you put the funnel together. Tell me what our goal is. I'm like, okay, cool. That sounds like a good goal. And I can see what they put in, but I'm such a big picture person. I have a harder time with the details and the technicalities and all that kind of stuff. But one thing I really like about my company, and I think it's kind of unique to us, whereas a lot of companies don't have this, is like, we're such a collaborative group that ultimately I'm the boss. What I say goes if I need to get on them for anything. But, you know, when I let them do what they're so good at and they love doing, they end up, they're so good with it that I don't really have to clamp down a whole lot and I don't have to necessarily gear them in certain directions. And if, if I'm good at something, I'll say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to run this one. But oftentimes I'm like, I don't know what you were doing. So if you'll pop me some ideas or whatever, and you know, then I'm not having to stress over stuff I don't know about. So I'm, we're a very collaborative group. Like it, most of our communications would never sound like we're boss and employee. Um, and again, I know that's unique to ours and we're such a small company that we kind of have that ability, but, um, it, it's getting to the point where I'm going to have to really write down and record our actual processes, but we're, we're a pretty creative company. So we get to kind of flow with it a little. And how do you get people to be that collaborative? So there's some organizations where people are just like hating each other and they want to kill their boss or, you know, their peers literally yeah. or metaphorically uh, <laughs> and uh <laughs> and then you're creating this kind of organization where where people are actually you know playing together in a way yeah well not really but but they are collaborating and they're creating something together kind of like you know kids building lego blocks together which is great yeah. which is how the organization should work but how do you actually do it are you do you have like special type of personality that is good for that based on Rick and Meyer's test or do you have <laughs> some, I don't know like I'm just wondering you know like um yeah. how do you how do you do that if I were to toot my own horn about this one I actually need to redo my Myers Brig it's been 15 years since I've done it I feel like I've changed so much that I I don't even know what I would say now but I think the one thing with me and I'm huge on this is I'm totally real. Like I don't sound any different right now than I sound like talking to my friends versus wherever I am. I sound the same all the time. And I talk to people just, you know, it's like I hear parents talking to kids and they're like, what? I'm like, what? I talk to kids exactly like I talk to an adult. Like I just don't <laughs> change in that. And so it's kind of like, I'm, I'm personable and I want you to be personable with me. Like I'm not going to not hire if the most genius website guy is offering and he's not got much of a personality than whatever, but I really talk to people and I relate to people and I want to know more about them. And I, I think it's such a human to human contact that has been lost over the years, whether it's a parent talking to a kid in a weird way or a boss can very often talk to an employee like they're an employee. I never talk to my employees like they're employees unless I have to occasionally it happens and I'll do it. But otherwise it's like, I don't see a hierarchy type of thing. And then when I'm hiring people much in that first bit of communication, I'm just talking to them. Like we're talking about relevant things, but I, I'm, I'm not gonna say I'm looking for personalities, but I can attract personalities and somebody with a personality and they're like, Hey, yeah, totally hear you. I, I, I would recommend this. And, you know, we start kind of talking like this and that carries forward because we continue talking like that. And, and again, I think one of the biggest things for me is really, I just never treat someone like an employee if I don't have to like, and so it requires a certain amount of capability on their part, but those are the people I'm looking for anyways. They're natural in their talent. They love doing what they're doing and they have fun and so on Upwork, I don't know about the other sites, but you can, in your posting, you can put um, questions and it can be like standard questions or whatever. And I'll say, 
I'll usually put two questions related to what my post is. And the very last question I ask every single time on every post is, are you awesome? And the only reason I put that on is for one, I get hilarious answers. Like I love reading the answers, but when somebody can answer that in a fun way and a whatever, it tells me so much about them, their communication, how fun are they? Are they a stick in the mud? Do they think I'm a snob for asking that? Like, oh my God, why is she asking if I'm awesome? Like, that's not the personality I'm looking for. And so my company is actually pretty well known for personality. And like I always say, like, we're not going to attract every person in the world. And quite frankly, there's a lot of people I don't really want to work with. So when we keep the personality, and it's why my company's named what it's named, it attracts other personalities. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of a hard one to teach necessarily like, Hey, have a certain kind of personality, but it really is just that talking to people like they're humans and just, you know, not, I don't know, employees or lesser than or dumb or whatever, just have real conversations. And I think it goes a long way. This is funny that you mentioned this question, how awesome are you? Because uh, we have the same question on our application uh, for people who work with us. <laughs> That's awesome. We have a question, how awesome are you in a scale from one to Richard Branson? So we just made this up as a yeah. joke. So it's, it's really funny that you actually mentioned that because it's, it's like almost the same thing. And we had the yeah. same impression. And then we are looking to work with people who have creative answers. Um, you mentioned that you're not great with sales and marketing, but do you think that this realness and being real and real conversations and, you know, natural way of developing report with people, is this mm -hmm. potentially helping you with sales? Do you think? Because yeah. the reason why I'm asking you is because since I became real, since, since I like literally stopped any sales techniques, you know, like, like yeah. straightforward, you know, persuasion, Jordan Belfort, all this stuff. Since I just started being real, um, yeah. I feel like I relate to people more and they relate to me more. Um, can you share more on how this helps in sales? And if you, you already said it, it does help, but could you, could you say more on this? For the guys yeah. who want to be real there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually all of my sales at this point because every time I try and do like a sales and marketing tactic, I fail miserably. And so all of my business has come from, so I had told you earlier, I'm a writer on a big real estate investing website. And even when I write, I sound just like me. Like everyone says I sound in my writing exactly like they can hear my voice type of thing. Like I swear I never change how I talk ever. And, but in that is I position myself to be like, Hey, I'm going to tell you like it is. And so that it's a marketing thing in and of itself that I didn't mean to try for, but it's where everybody's coming from because they read my material, they read my content and they realize that I'm going to tell them the truth. And it's when I first started my company, I, it's in real estate investing and real estate investing, probably similar to a lot of other industries. There's been scams over the years. There's it's so many stuffy guys in suits behind desks telling you what you should buy. It's like salesperson trying to tell you what you should invest in and they don't even invest in it. Like it's a very, it's an intimidating industry. And so when I kind of got into it, it was kind of by accident, but when I got into it, my, the only thing going through my head was, listen, I'm just going to pitch myself as me and be like, Hey, I'm just this chick and I bought stuff that I like. I'll tell you what it is. Like that was all that was going to come out of my mouth. And I'm not going to claim to be, because I think that's a lot of it too, is people are like, I'm an expert in something, something, and you should buy this. And it's like, well, okay. And I never do that. Like I just, I'll be the first person to tell people that they should not buy the things that I work with. Um, I'm such a bad salesperson that I went to a networking event a few months ago and I had just made new business cards. And I passed quite a few of them out and I had a guy come up to me and tell me, Hey, um, there's no contact information on this. Like I made a whole pack of business cards with not one ounce of contact information, no phone number, no email, didn't even have my name on it. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, and so it's, and, and that's the contrary to the people who are just trying to sell you something all the time. And it's like, <laughs> well, how do you know? Like, it sounds like they have such an agenda. Like, how do you know if they're being real? And so 
I think we're in a time and place in the world with the internet and podcasts and whatever. My bookshelf, because I'm like, which of these authors, like Gary Vaynerchuk, for example, there is no doubt that that guy is absolutely just real and just firing it out of his mouth. And so who am I going to trust with social media info? Gary Vaynerchuk. And so I, it's just, I think sales are changing and I would like to open up other avenues of sales and marketing for my company. But every, like I said, every time I to, try and do a traditional one, just like you're saying is I, I either get negative feedback or it doesn't work anyways. And the one thing people really respond to is I just start rambling and I'm like, here's what I got. I'm not going to say it's going to work for you, but it worked for me. And you know, like, how are you not going to trust that? So yeah, I think, I think if anyone has the possibility or the option to just be real, oh, I mean, really, because who else can be you? And so you're not, you're automatically not even going to have a competitor. And I've thought about that with my company. I'm like, well, technically somebody could do exactly what I do, but the reality is they're not me and my personality is all over that thing. And so I, I just can't have that direct of a competitor for the, you know, like no one's going to compete with my personality. And so, yeah, I, I really, I think that's the ticket to a lot of stuff and it saves you a lot of money on marketing. Cause then you don't have to pay a fortune to try marketing. You can just be you for free and it's the internet. So you can do it all over the place. I was, I was analyzing marketing strategy of dead mouse. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this uh, musician. Yeah, oh, yeah. And he has a very interesting marketing strategy where he's just putting himself out there. He's just trying to keep this as real as possible. And this is very interesting what is happening, not only in business, but also in music, uh, where he is live streaming how he's producing the music. And if mm -hmm. you've seen any of his live streams, but he's literally like, uh, you know, editing music. And then he's putting this on a live stream and everybody can see that. And um, yeah. And the reason why this is interesting is because people are bored of this marketing bullshit. And as you're saying, like, yeah. it seems like everyone has their agenda and they are trying to push something and then you're just much more real and they're like, Hey, this is fresh. Yeah. And yeah, I totally agree with you. And, um, I think that this is very interesting where we're going with marketing and sales where this actually is disappearing in yeah. a way. That's very interesting. When you're writing, and I, don't, I don't know if this is a worthy stat, but I've thought about marketing. So over the, I guess, six years that we've been in business, I can tell you for a fact that every, we, we have an absolute zero success rate with trying the old school marketing things like social media. I mean, social media is fantastic for the right business. It's a little harder for mine, but we've tried social media. We've tried email funneling. We've tried everything you could ever read in a sales book, 0% success. I don't think I've ever sold a property doing that. Where on the other hand, when I just talk or write or whatever, and I just put my stuff out there, we have a hundred percent success rate. Like every single sale we have had, and I've, my company is now facilitated at the five year mark. It was $18 million in real estate transactions. So we're probably at I don't know, 20 or 25 million at this point. And all of that has come from this kind of new, newer age personality, real thing, as opposed to absolutely zero sales with no exception with the old stuff. So for what that's worth. It's very interesting. Sort of rant on the current stage of state of sales. Yeah. And I, you've even got my brain going. I'm like, huh, I, I gotta, yeah. I think this is a thing. <laughs> like, it is a thing. Yeah, it is, a, it totally it is, is a thing. I was I was analyzing the entire marketing strategy of Dead Mouse with uh, with his mm -hmm. marketing team, and uh, they actually told me that this is a thing. Like people yeah. who actually work for him and make his marketing strategy, they said this is the thing. It has to be real. He has to throw anything out of his head randomly, and then we just yep. distribute it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's exactly. Thing. Yeah. It's a Absolutely. thing. When you're writing these articles. Uh, and you're just trying to show people, hey, I'm going to tell you how it is. Um, what kind of copywriting or writing um, strategies? Maybe it's a big word because we just said, hey, there is no strategies. We're just telling you honestly how it is. But how do you actually write the way that it comes across as 
this is the reality. Is there anything that the guys who are watching this could learn? Sh shall they learn any special way of copywriting or uh, anything that you've learned during your you know, self-education that helped you become a good writer that people mm -hmm. can resonate with as they are reading this? Because yeah. I know that they are reading this and they're like, hey, this is true. Like, this makes sense. I, I resonate with this. She's saying how it is. How to write like that? So I think it was my first year of college, I think. I was in an English class and I had a really cool professor. And I was a pretty good writer anyways, but she would give us assignments. <clears throat> and one paper I wrote, I have no idea what it was about. I turned it in and she gave it back and it said, come see me or something. I was like, oh. And she sat me down and she said, listen, your papers sound like you were trying to be a writer. And in that, they're sounding more complicated. They're sounding flowy. Like I was trying to sound, well, like a writer, like a professional writer, whatever I was trying to sound smart, whatever I was trying to sound like. And she gave me the piece of advice that has literally formed well, essentially my whole career, because my career is primarily based on my writing. She said, instead of trying to sound a certain way or make the paper sound a certain way, write the paper in exactly the same way as if you were saying it to somebody. So whatever you're writing about, if you're talking it to somebody, transcribe it exactly how it comes out of your mouth. And to this day, I consistently get feedback saying, oh my God, I can totally hear your voice. Like truly, if you read my articles, they sound just like I talk. I mean, there's no difference. You can even probably tell in the articles where I'm laughing or where I'm anything, like even without an LOL. And that advice, it was, and it made it so simple because when I was trying to sound a certain way, it was, I was kind of going against my own grain. I was swimming upstream and then it sounded like shit at the end of it anyways. And when I was able to just transcribe my own voice, it took no thought. And it has been, it set me apart from a lot of writers because I think it's so easy for us in many situations in life, but especially writing, that we try and sound a certain way. And so back to this whole be real thing, don't try and sound like anything other than you because people are going to call you on it. Like we're, we're really in this day and age where you cannot get away with that. So, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk cusses like a banshee. I mean, my mother would just cringe if she ever heard him speak. And if I ever spoke like that, which I do in real life, but my mother doesn't hear it, like she would just die. And, but he, he, there's no doubt that he's talking just like, and I, I keep going back to Gary Vaynerchuk just because he's about the most real person I can think of as an example, but you know, he sounds just like him. Even his writing sounds just like him. His books sound just like him and he's him. It, there's no competition for him. And so, yeah, being real, like for writing, screw, what is it? APA style or whatever we all learned in school, like old right double spaces after a period, you know, whatever, like make it readable, but make it you just transcribe you. And that more than anything gives writing so much power in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I should probably just uh, get someone to transcribe my videos and then I have articles then maybe. You, well, and that's it. Honestly, that's a huge marketing move because like I've thought about, you know, even ghostwriters, like people who don't have time to sit and write their own book. If you're a better speaker, Oh my God, you could get a ghostwriter to transcribe it or your videos. I mean, it's repurposing content. So in this marketing idea, like I have somewhere in the ballpark of like 190 articles I've written for this website. And unfortunately when I give them to the website, they own it. So I have okay. to be pretty careful with it afterwards. But instead of creating new content, I have 190 articles that are already a foundation of information that I could do something with. I could make videos with it. I could make, I mean, shoot, I could give that article to someone who does like making videos and let them make a video. Say, Hey, make a video based on this article. Mm -hmm. Like 
Oh, the more you can, as a business owner, the more you can repurpose stuff that you've already done. Absolutely phenomenal. So yeah, if you can get someone to transcribe into video and to writing, whatever, you only have to do this one job, let them do that. And now you have triple the content. Oh, easily. And how do you, cause you were mentioning Gary V a lot and his honesty on that note, how do you distinguish honesty on the internet, especially in terms of real estate advisors and YouTube of mm -hmm. which you can, you know, find a lot of these now, uh, to some scammy guys who are just like, Hey, this is how to invest in real estate. And then, you know, they sign you up for a course that costs money and doesn't bring results. So how do you distinguish this? By the way, I have nothing against signing up people in courses and charging money if they work. So, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, I do some of these myself, but, um, yeah. but like, how do you distinguish, um, honesty and what, what works in terms of, you know, those guys on YouTube who are talking about real estate, for example. Well, I think one of the things, and I've had to think about this with my own marketing is who is the person talking about? Like Gary V, for example, and even I do it is I talk about me and my experiences. I'm like, Hey, I found this kind of investment property that I really like. I bought it worked for me. Here's my numbers. Here's what I learned from it. And like, if you read all my writings and my responses to people and whatever, I never ever tell people a, what they should be doing, or I don't even claim to be right. I'm like, well, my experience, I fit, this is what I found to each their own because I'm never going to claim to know. I, I don't know. How do I know? Whereas the guys who claim to know everything, that's probably your first hint. Like mm -hmm. Gary V, not one time in any of his books that I've read has he said, this is how it is. Or like, you have to do this. Or he's kind of like, I'm pretty sure it's like this. And this is how I experience it. And this is the results I've seen, but take it or leave it. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to tell you what I know and what I've experienced. Have fun with it. Try it for yourself. Maybe you don't like it. I don't know. And then, like I said, I've said a couple of times, I'm such a bad salesperson. I'll be the first one to tell you, don't buy this property. Like this is not what you need to be buying. And so when people hear me say that to people, they can, they have more of a trust to know. I'll tell you if it's not for you. Whereas these sales guys who are, first of all, are they actually doing what they're selling? Are they buying what they're selling? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. And, and I tell people I've bought what i promote for sure. Like it's, I'm a boutique referral system. I don't send you to anything that I haven't invested in myself. And so if you kind of, and my favorite quote in the world, and I go by it off of it every day is don't, um, don't, uh, sorry, don't take advice from someone you wouldn't trade shoes with. And so if the person that's speaking to you, look at that person, what kind of life are they living? What are they saying? are they telling you what you should and shouldn't be doing and they know exactly what's right for you because that's, that's not true. Are they a sales guy sitting behind a desk wearing a suit working nine to five, but they're trying to tell you how to achieve financial freedom? Uh, you know, it, so, and that's what I've gotten a lot of my stuff from my business mentor, everything. I looked at him and I was like, Hey, wait a minute. What are you doing? Like, I saw him in his flip flops and it's a midday and he just got done traveling. I'm like, I need your life. What, what's going on here? And so I take his advice. And so I, I think it's so much about the source and, and those guru programs and paying for classes and whatever. I think a lot of them are really valid. Like I did it when I was exploring, like I'd pay the $500 for a three day workshop. It was mostly sales, but I got some good info off of it. I went to conferences. I went to the networking things. I think paying for certain tools is a great tool depending on where you're getting it from. Um, but yeah, I think it's so much about the source. And I think, you know, guys like you who are doing podcasts, just by you doing the podcast, somebody can get to know you because if you have the option of getting to know the person who's speaking, you can feel out whether you trust them or not, whether versus if you just came to me in a suit and said, Hey, you should buy this thing. Okay. Like those are the people I think you need to be leery of just, they're trying to sell you something. So, and the, and the reality is no person's path is going to be the same. What worked for me is not going to work exactly for you versus this other person. 
And if somebody who's trying to teach you something can't acknowledge that you're going to have your own path and your own options, you know, take it or leave it. I have the last question for you because we're getting okay. close to an hour and I feel like I'm exploiting you a lot. We <laughs> I love it. Exploit uh. me. <laughs> That sounds wrong. Oh yeah, uh, I guess it goes that <laughs> no no um, So uh, the last question I actually ask every person I'm getting on a call these days about that, and it's a little bit more of a deeper question, and it's about mindset. It's not that hands-on. It's not as much practical advice, but I like to ask a lot of successful entrepreneurs and and in general amazing people i'm talking with like hey what's your what's your like mindset what's your like philosophy and i get a lot of guys saying very interesting things like yeah you know what like i started believing in abundance and started like you know holding things and then started sharing in terms of like whatever knowledge or you know business network and then bam this is when it started for me uh, the right. question to you is what is your philosophy what is your mindset that you think was helping you and sort of getting you where you are right now over the last six years of running this business uh and it's a tough than, one so other than <laughs> drinking a lot of alcohol okay. <laughs> <laughs> got to survive on a roller coaster somehow um you know <laughs> now i guess I, mike is laughing as well yeah <laughs> Wine, I find, is very helpful. Um, so years ago, I didn't really know what the word was for my mindset, but now I've actually done a lot of study in this field is spiritual psychology. Um, I've actually since gotten a degree in spiritual psychology. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how that even happened. But now that I understand how all of that works, and it's not religious, it's not, it, you can be an atheist and believe in this. It, it's not anything about that. But it's more uh, things like trusting, kind of surrendering to the pro. Like I had to surrender to the process. My first year of entrepreneurship, I didn't know where my rent check was coming from. I didn't know if I was going to be able to feed myself. And for being a control freak going into that, like it was very humbling because I can control the airplane I fly. I can control my engineering problems. I can make the solution happen. I could make everything happen in my life before I started a business. And all of a sudden it's like, um, oh God, like I, I had to go into the surrender and trust kind of mindset. And one of my favorite author, I always look over here cause my books are over here, but, mm -hmm. uh, Jack Canfield wrote, um, the success principles. And in, I read that it's such an amazing book, but a lot of them are like, affirmations and you know all this woo woo i live in california so we're like the kings and queens of the <laughs> kings of woo -woo. Woo -woo. they're like mm, yeah. fruits and the nuts here we are but i found that there's there's something to it and it's so back then it, i knew when i was in my corporate job i had to work for myself and i knew when i quit my job and i started my company i had no idea how it was going to happen i had no idea what was going to come of it I had no idea how any of it was going to work, but I knew just a deep in my soul that I had to do it. And so I was like, well, hold my nose. I'm jumping in the deep end. And off I went. And everybody thought I had lost my mind. And I, I had no assurances, no anything, but I knew I had to do it. And then this learning the trust thing, like it really, I hate using the word because I don't want to. I don't want people who don't resonate with the word to drop out, but it's a spiritual kind of process. Like you have to learn these kinds of principles of guess what? You can't manhandle this. Like, I mean, you can try, but it's going to end up manhandling you and you're going to have to learn to be okay with that and how to stick with that through the whole thing and how to cope. I had never really even had many emotions before it. Like I'm a girl, but I wasn't really good with that feelings thing. Oh my God, that stupid journey gave me feelings. And I was like, oh great. Now I'm trying to start a business and make income and I have feelings that I don't understand on top of it. Like, come on. <laughs> and so it's, you know, it's a, it's a ride that it's not just starting a business. It's a, it's a mental 
trick. It's a mental roller coaster. Like it's going to test you. It is absolutely going to test you. And when you think it's done testing you, it's not, it's going to keep going. And I feel like the people who make it through the tests are the ones who make it. It's not about whether your product works or not. It's whether you're going to survive these tests. It's, it's like the, uh, what do you call it? The not introduction, but like the, it's like a rite of passage. Like you have to go through it. You have to be broke. You have to not know where your grocery bills coming from. So yeah, it, it, now that I understand the word spiritual, it is kind of a spiritual thing. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, we are right on time. I really, really appreciate this value. Thank you so much. If you guys want to contact you, I'm going to link to your, um, whatever you will send me, either YouTube channel or whatever you want. So I'll okay. just put it under the video so guys can definitely find out more about you if they want to. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the values. Awesome, man. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it.